Hello and welcome to the third part of the Regenerative Viticulture series. Um, I'm Abby Rose, I'm the CEO at VitaCycle. Um, and at VitaCycle we're committed to building ecology, profitability and beauty on farms around the world. And we make apps that support obs basically observation as a key tool for understanding what works for a specific farm or vineyard. And many of you watching uh, may already be aware of or use our app Sector Mentor, which is specifically for vineyards. Um, Sector Mentor makes it easy to predict yields, monitor ripeness, um, understand soil health and biodiversity, uh, track different vineyard management tasks, block by block, and much more. Um, in essence, we've built Sector Mentor to be the tool to support regenerative viticulture. Um, and so through our work, we have the privilege of um, being in contact with some amazing regenerative practitioners and advisors. And this is how we actually met both Dan and Luke, who are in conversation today. Um, so I've had fascinating discussions with both of them um, at different times. And in a way, the Regenerative Viticulture series is all about bringing together some of these amazing conversations and the amazing work that's going on um, around the world um, and trying to share that knowledge amongst us and really build a growing regenerative viticulture movement um, in the UK and beyond. Um, and so I also wanted to, we also wanted to highlight the work of um, Nicole, uh, Ben, and then Dan today um, as some of the brilliant resources and leading thinkers if you do want to take a more regenerative approach. So I'm going to introduce um, the, or give a bit of background behind Dan and Luke, and then I'll hand over to Luke. Um, so Dan Rinke consults for vineyards, orchards, wineries and cideries that are looking for support in converting to regenerative farming and low intervention winemaking. Dan studied viticulture and plant science, has worked at several vineyards, and most recently he headed up Johan Vineyards, which is an 88 acre certified organic biodynamic dry farmed and minimally tilled vineyard and winery in Oregon. Dan speaks and consults internationally about implementing regenerative approaches to improve the ecology and profitability of vineyards. Dan is so full of brilliant insights into organic, biodynamic and regenerative practices. And I feel like I visited Dan a few times and every time I'm blown away with new thinking and information and you know new experiments he's doing. And it really is exciting to be uh, sharing some of Dan's thinking here today with everyone. Um, and interviewing Dan is Luke Spaulding, who is manager of Everflight Vineyard in Sussex, UK. Um, Luke messaged us a few months ago, back in December, I think, saying, you know, he's excited about regenerative viticulture. Should we set up a regenerative viticulture working group together? Um, and so we told him about this event at the time. And of course, it made a lot of sense that he would be the perfect person to um, ask Dan some nitty-gritty questions and get really into the practicalities of what does it mean to implement regenerative viticulture. Uh, not to mention Luke's eagle eye for detail and incredible focus on monitoring what's going on in the vineyard and then learning from that. Um, and in a way, both Dan and Luke have that in common. Um, you know, they are so good at monitoring um, and doing experiments and learning from them and then building from there. Um, and they both use Sector and Mentor to support them with that. So I'm going to pass over to Luke to take the reins from here and give him, I'll be feeding in your Q&A questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, Luke's recording starts just a little bit short of the very beginning, so that's why it feels like his question's coming in halfway through, but you don't lose any information. So just keep watching and it will all flow. Thanks so much. Enjoy. Sustainability was in terms of profitability and also, you know, environmentally. So I was just wondering if you could like expand on that and tell everyone. Yeah. Um, so I started at Johan in 2007 and the day I showed up, uh, the crew was out spraying Roundup 
and that was <laughs> the last time that happened. Um, we uh, converted to biodynamic farming right away. I, uh, the previous two vineyards I had worked at, or actually all the vineyards I've worked at have either been organic or biodynamic in the past. And so we converted to, started the conversion to biodynamic in 2007 and, um, you know, saw, um, saw the vine's evolution um, as it was getting used to the, the biodynamic farming and organic practices um you know just going cold turkey right off of glyphosate and um salt-based fertilizers and um rolled right into organic and we see you know i saw a dip in the the production of the vineyard um pretty substantially from 2008 through 2000 10, 11, I would say, about 2011, 2012. I would say by 2012, it was back on um, a healthy vineyard again. Um, so it took quite some time. It took longer than the three years that they talk about for cert to maintain your certification. Um, and I've always, ever since then, I've always been curious about how we can make conversions happen quicker. And um, over the years at Johan, I... I um, kept on getting new blocks back from long-term leases from our neighbors. So I got a chance to experiment with conversions. Um, and then um, in 2014, um, I got really interested in no-till farming and regenerative agriculture. And, um, you know, I was reading stuff from Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta and all these guys doing no-till farming in um, mostly the central United States on grains um, and decided that I thought it could work well in a perennial system. Why not? I think it would, it fits a perennial system more than, more so than an annual system. Um, and just went from there. So how, how, how do you first buy, you know, implementing this? For those people who maybe don't know about no till it's literally no herbicide, no cutting off crops, and literally no no tillage, no cultivation in the soil to basically set up a seedbed. And um, yeah, so I, I actually did start my no till farming with okay. tilling. <laughs> okay. First run, yeah. Um so um yeah, I mean we we went through that last time and tilled everything made their made sure that the the ground was flat and even and you know all that got a good really good cover crop um germinated and that was the other thing is getting that good soil um seed to soil um interaction to get a good stand a good cover crop started um but i basing everything or basing the cover crop mix mostly on perennials um it was a lesson learned that it takes a good full year before that cover crops in in full production like that those those perennial cover crop systems take a, a good year to just to establish it's not not like those annuals where they're up and going in spring and they're waist high um yeah and so it just just starting to work with it from there and um we uh, originally we had um you know you're usually limited by equipment and a budget uh usually some wineries are not and um, they're very lucky on the ones that are not um but we started off with using an under the vine cultivator so we were even though we were no-till in the alleys we were not no-till underneath the vines originally and it wasn't until 2000 uh just last year 2020 that we got a under the vine mower. I had two blocks that that um, we were just hand hand weed eating instead of um, using under the vine cultivator on just to to trial it and to see if it would work and be viable and not, you know, everybody's worried about competition, competition, competition with cover crops and grapevines. And uh, I don't see a competition for an established vineyard. Yeah, I was gonna say it's going to be an established vineyard. Um, I, I, I did something, you know, a while back where we put a cover crop in the first year it was planted to try and neutralize any, you know, unwanted competition with big, big docks and nettles and 
it delayed the whole process of establishment by a year in terms of yeah. you know, the growth cycle of the vine. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying about once the vine's established, that you can then go and, and, and you don't need to worry about these, these competitive cover crops. Yeah, I almost think it's the opposite. I think it's it creates more of a community and it helps the vines. That's the way I, I look at it. Um, what cover crops have you used that you know have worked for you? Um, what kind of like seeds? You know, what what perennials have you been using? Um, well, <laughs> my uh, my well, um, cover crops. No, no one does last in here. <laughs> Yeah, my my cover crop seed salesmen are um, think I'm pretty crazy because I'm honestly I'm not really particular on the species because we really do not know what works perfect in vineyards for cover crops. For me, it's all about getting the diversity of plants in the ground and having diverse uh, diverse root depths. So your 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 rooting is the the roots of the cover crops are um, at different depths, at different shapes. Um, each plant, you got to keep in mind, each plant um, photosynthesizes different, has uh, different associations with different microorganisms, and um, has different root exudates. And the root exudates on the cover crop is the important part of uh really I, I the way i look at it is it's it makes the entire system it, like your entire vineyard ecosystem is based off of your the root exudates that you're getting from your cover crop uh simply because you're looking at um the amount of uh the percentage of the ground covered compared to the percentage of the ground covered from grapevines and you can get way more root biomass from your cover crops and more photosynthetic material to energize your soils, to drive your the microbiology, uh, which then drives the health of the entire ecosystem, including the vines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's one thing I've, I've, I've seen is, you know, just to have one layer of root mass and one layer of, of, of you know, biomass on the top of the surface just, just doesn't really work. It's not very really beneficial. So if you still, you know, I, I've got grasses which go down 40 centimeters, and I've got ones that do 10 centimeters in, in my cover crops. Um, yeah, and I, you know, and that difference in depth, I, I find really is beneficial. Yeah, I think that also um, helps get some of you know the deeper rooting ones to, to get them to last later in the season. Uh, we have a much different climate than you do, and so we really don't get rain after uh, the 5th of July. And, um, and so, so, you know, our, you know, come July through the end of the year, our, our, most of our cover crops are just brown, dead grass. And um, what I want to see is I want to see um, flowering species late that late to help with the pollinators to bring the, the pollinators later into the year. Um, plants that are still photosynthesizing that late in the year, some legumes working like bird's foot trefoil is a good one. Um, you know, chicories. Uh, our orchard, I love to see orchard grasses in there because they are a deeper rooting grass. Some of the native um, perennial grasses that we have here in Oregon um, are really nice. They kind of bunch up and make it kind of um, a bumpy alleyway, but they, they're great um, plants to have a system. I mean, I mean, I mean really we should just try and win this in a little bit. You know, once, once you've created that, that kind of cover crop and, and that kind of mass, that biomass, that root mass, I suppose really we start to think about how, you know, you said about the ecosystem. And what we really should start thinking about is these carbon pathways, these, these liquid carbon pathways that that then helps, you know, build into the soil around it, as well as the vines and, then, and how that works. Because, you know, it starts with photosynthesis and it's how that photosynthesis thing transports or translocates through the plant into the root system and then feeds the microbe, microbes all around it. And I was just wondering if you've seen 
seen you know real real benefits with that in your farms you know where it's been better yields or you know better taste or um yeah well the main thing that i can that i can um attest to is the phs of the soils have gone down since i've gone to no-till okay which is interesting because you think about these root carbon exudates and most people think of them as organic acid secretions along with um, carbon monoxide. The soil your is going to go down with it. Um, so we are we're already starting with a fairly acidic uh, soil too. So our, our pH is a those are stars. Okay, yeah, and okay. so so the the block that I've had um, under um, the block that I've had under no till the longest uh, when I got there in 2007 it was 5.1 pH soil pH and then uh, 2014 um, 2011 I tested the soils again it was 5.6 and I did do a lime and dolomite lime application and then 2014 it was it wasn't much more it was like 5.8 so it was just like barely bumped it up a little bit by adding all that lime and it was only like two tons per acre um and then by 2017 it was at 6.8 pH and that was after maintaining a full cover crop for only three years. Okay. I mean, so generally that that tells me that you must be like your, your inputs, your you know, your fertilizers, your inputs into the soil must be, you know, as you say, almost minimal or massively reduced to conventional. Is that mm -hmm. what you found? Um, yeah, I mean my my fertilizer input from really from 2000, 2014 until just last year, I started dabbling with some foliars, and probably I'm going to come back with some nutrition at Johan this year. I know I'm I'm not I'm I'm working as consulting factor at Johan at this point, but um, we're definitely talking about looking at a little bit of nutrition. But we're we're mostly instead of looking at heavy nutrition, we're mostly looking at stimulating biology instead, because we we really feel that we have. Um, a fair, really healthy soil that if we just start kicking the biology a little bit more, we'll get that nutrient cycling going through, um, mostly through the liquid carbon pathway, like we were talking about. We get, we get a better um, efficiency on photosynthesis, so then we can get, you know, once we get to that point, uh, which I feel that we're, we're probably at most of the blocks, um, but then I want to get to that point where we're getting complete um, protein synthesis. Yeah, so we were talking about this the other day. I have to say, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, so, could you just explain a little bit about you know the carbon, carbon liquid pathways, and, and, and the proteins involved in that? And, and yeah, for sure. So, um, carbon liquid pathway is essentially turning, um, taking the one outside source, which would be um, sunlight energy. And that's our, our energy in creating carbon for the plant. But once, once a plant's um, at a point where it's healthy enough that it can um, sustain itself, yeah, yeah, it can sustain can sustain itself. Basically, just create just just do basic um, plant physiology and in, in trying to create uh, a seed to yeah. propagate. Um, once it gets to that point, so plants can be anywhere between, can put anywhere between 20 to 60% of their carbon produced through photosynthesis down into their root system to feed, uh, basically to feed the microbiology, but not necessarily just to feed the micro microbiology. The plant then in exchange gets nutrients. Um, you know, the, the microbiology is are way more complex than just giving, doing an even exchange for carbon for um nutrients they're they're getting um they're exchanging hormones um a lot of microbiology plant hormones are um microbiology and plant hormones are, are one in the same so they're exchanging those they're exchanging uh proteins um 
And so, uh, you know, you got to think of a carbohydrates, not just a simple sugar. They could be anywhere from simple sugars to complex sugars, um, to um, organic acids, to uh, amino, amino acids, um, and different types of proteins. And those are all carbon-based um, products. You know, yeah. so so there that's that's all part of the the liquid carbon pathway that gets sent down there, and then the microorganisms pick that that up, and then the microorganisms thrive, and some die off, and some get absorbed into the plant. And there's, you know, there's all this new emerging microbiology work that's been done um, by uh, the um, the rhizophagy where. They're saying plant roots can even just engulf entire microorganisms and suck out the nutrients they want and then push them out through their root hairs and, and keep cycling the, the microorganisms. So there's cycles on, on top of cycles working here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. As you say, it, it kind of just like blew my mind. It's like bioengineering, bio, biochemical engineering. For soil, really. Right. Mother Nature is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, so, and I mean, I think we, we touched on it as well. Is, is you know, you, you don't have to just look at cover crops as well. I mean, you've done some exciting stuff with with, with wood chip and and willow, uh, as well as you know permaculture. I mean, you know, we, we kind of got into it at the end as well. We talked about permaculture as well and how you're integrating. You know trees in, into the vineyard so i mean i think we both have that kind of common understanding because I, i've seen it in champagne with with um with chip being used um and how it changes the soil structure and i was just wondering if you can like tell us about it. yeah so the wood chip pile idea really came from uh laval university in quebec canada in the early 80s, about 1982, they did a study on what they called ramial wood chip piles, which were uh, deciduous tree limbs that were like uh, two inches in diameter or so. So they're, they had a, a higher percentage of um, bark and like the cambium layer compared to heartwood, because that's where a lot of um, a lot of the nutrients and plant hormones and um, and honestly, easier digestible um, lignans are. Um, and so basically the idea is you, you put down, uh, you, you take these limbs and you chip them and you, you put them in your um, vineyard. Well, it was studied to be orchards and I've just kind of adopted it into vineyards. Um, I've really picked up the, the idea from uh, an orchardist um, on the East Coast named Michael Phillips, who's written several books, um, The Apple Grower, uh, Holistic Orchard, and um, A Mycorrhizal Planet, which is an excellent book too, if you ever get a chance. Um, and these wood chip piles, as I, as I started looking into them more and uh, reading more about it and listening to mycologists, um, they start talking about how, what the, the fungal component actually does is it's breaking down these lignans and working on these wood chip piles. They're, they're actually, they're not just, um, eating the carbon and creating nutrients available for plants. Um, they're also at the same time, uh, having different metabolic chemical, um, secondary metabolites that are just getting pushed out as a process of excreting acids to break down the, the lignans and stuff like that. And um, one example, I know there's, there's, I'm sure there's millions of different things that are happening in these compost piles more than, than just this, but one example is that um, as the, the fungus is breaking down this lignin, it creates a, a chemical compound called p-cumeric acid. Um, P-cumeric acid is a, known as a detoxifying agent or a, a, a precursor to de detoxifying agents. And these same things are in, um, these same things are in um, your liver. Uh, so P-cumeric acid is also associated with human liver. So detoxifying your body. So I look at these wood chip piles as, as um, 
as little livers throughout my ecosystem, you know? And so if you, if you take it all back to where grape vines and um, even orchard trees developed, they're on the edge of these woods. And you think of a, a, a wood edge or a riparian wooded area, and you've got tree branches falling all over the place, whether they're, you know, um, mostly softwoods in, the, in that area, or I'm sorry, hardwoods in that area, so deciduous trees. Um, and so the same thing would be happening there. And, um, you know, I'm not to say that um, woody trunk diseases don't happen in those areas, but I just tend to wonder if that's part of the ecological system is to have um, when plants lack these um, that amount of lignin being broken down in a system, if that drives um, the ecology of the system to create woody diseases. So then you have that is what causes like trunk diseases and grapevines. Yeah. You know, right now we're having a huge problem with ESCA and um, all these different um, trunk diseases, ESCA and petri disease and. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah much sphere die back and yeah you type of here and you know there's there's all kinds of crazy things that are happening and i'm just wondering if these um little livers in my in my ecosystem will help clean that that up i mean yeah i mean as, as i say where i saw in champagne is it was in the lance on biodynamic vineyards they have there and the vineyard manager was quite clear he, he said this will one you know improve the soil but two increase health in the vines um he, he didn't talk about livers but he did say it was almost like a cleansing effect across across his but what he had also done is he he planted uh like wild strawberries uh pumpkins uh, a tree here and there to try and you know encourage biodiversity across the entire site um I think mean, it's quite interesting because we talked about the, the liquid pathway, the liquid carbon pathway. And he, he said to me that this was almost like the, the dead carbon pathway. So, you know, it's the decomposing, you know, side of it. There's two different pathways. And if you can create both in the same, in the same place, then you kind of got a full circle. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, you know, we keep on talking about the benefits of all of this, but one thing I know you're really into, and I'm, I'm just getting my head around it, is, is sap analysis and, and, how, and, and how we can use that to, to, to basically monitor certain nutrients in the, in the, in the vineyard. Um, you know, I, I know you said when you started out, you had this one site you thought there was an issue with, and you wished you had a way of understanding what was going on. And now we've got sap analysis. Yeah, I mean, sap analysis is, um, well, one, how, uh, the first part is, is how it's the part of the plant that you're actually examining compared to, um, or how it's extracted to examine. Um, so if you look at old traditional uh, leaf or petiole analyses, the, the first thing they do is dry them out to a powder yeah. um, and then grind them up and then run liquid acids or bases through them to extract out the chemicals to then analyze how much is there. Um, which to me could potentially lead to some falsities, although, you know, over time you get used to the standards, you know, and, and that they have. I mean, they've been doing these since what, the four, 30s, 40s? Um, you know, um, which is, which is great. Um, but the other thing too is, is all the other parameters that you can look at within the sap analysis. So what sap analysis is actually, um, analyzing is the cytoplasm, um, within the leaf cells. Um, and the main reason why I think that that is important is, um, one for that's where the plants store their their nutrition before they can start converting it and using it uh and two um 
that's also where um, endophytic fungi and bacteria go to get a lot of the nutrients from the plant itself. So your, your microbial world is also um, getting their nutrition from that exact place that we're analyzing uh, along with where your plants get storing its nutrition. So it's, you're looking at, at what the total available nutrition is for both the plant and the microbial world at the same time. Um, not that we've um, stepped into the realm of completely understanding the microbial realm. We're, we're I don't even think in kindergarten at this point, um, but we're, um, we're working on it. Um, the other thing that I really like about SAP analyses is uh, the amount of um, things that they, they look at Be besides just the main nutrients that an, an old conventional um, leaf sample would be. Um, they're also looking at pH of the vine, electroconductivity of the vine, um, bricks measurements um, of the leaves. Um, and then they get into a lot of um, micro, um, the micronutrients that we never looked at. Like, um, I think I was telling you last time we were, we were um, I had a agronomist out when I first started working at Johan and um, I, I was looking at the vines and I was like, you know, this kind of, I was reading a lot about uh, molybdenum, molly um, deficiencies. <laughs> And I asked him, I was like, well, can we test for this? And he's like, oh no, there's no reason to test for Molly. Like there's plenty of Molly in the system. Vine, vines and plants in general only need a very minimal, minimal amount. And there's plenty in your soil. So you don't have to test for that. Um, another example is um, I went to uh, the physiology um, uh, uh, doctor for the, um, here in Corvallis and I, I asked him, he's the, the plant nutrition guy in our area. And I, I asked him, I was like, how come we don't test for things other than nitrate? How come we don't test for ammonia or, or total nitrogen? And he's just like, it doesn't matter that it's all the same. Um, which, you know, as we're learning now, it's, it, it's a huge difference. It's, it's, you know, one of those things that we can use to, um, check the health of our vine by seeing how our, our excuse me, <coughs> to see how our vines, see how the, our, our vines are um, going through complete protein synthesis. Um, you know, you can look at your, in the leaf sample analyses will give you your nitrates, your ammonium, and then it'll also give you total nitrate. So if you're, um, nitrate and ammonium are um, both low and your total nitrogen is high, that's telling you that most of your nitrogen is getting converted into um, complete proteins. And that's where um, a truly healthy, fully efficient plant oh, is yeah. moving. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 for me, that, that is, you know, the full cycle leading into vine health, vine, vine natural protection against, against diseases and, and, you know, fungus, fungus, you know, you, with that, you'll need to reduce your fungal size, basically. If you have that, you know, proteins and that nitrogen in there, you'll be, you know, better off. You, you won't need to depend so much on certain fungicides to get you through the year. Yeah. I think we were talking earlier about, you know, downy being our issue, our biggest issue here in this country, yours is powdery. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, since you went organic, you know, that vine health, that vine natural defense, how have you seen that evolve when you converted Johan and other sites that you've, you've managed? Yeah, you know, it, it took a little bit of time and I think, um... You know, I think there's a big difference between um, being organic and being um, a biological farmer, if you will. I, you know, I, I, we're always striving for new words because they keep getting appropriated by um, people that aren't really doing the, the right thing. Um, but there's, you know, there's organic farmers out there that that just are conventional farmers that replace 
one chemical with another chemical. It's just that it happens to be naturally derived. Um, but I think when you're talk, thinking about the whole system, thinking about your soil and thinking about, you know, all the microbiology that's on the canopy of the vine, on the, the vine trunk, the vine canes, um, all the microbiology in the soil. I mean, you really got to consider your fungicide sprays because that's exactly what you're, you know, you're killing all the good guys that are helping you in the health of the vine. Um, so, you know, most organic grower, vineyard viticulturalists that I know are really reliant heavily on sulfur. And I, um, you know, I don't think that using sulfur a couple of times in the season, especially in the highest pressure times are necessarily horrible. I mean, if you could get away with no sulfur whatsoever, that would be amazing. Um, and, you know, that should be what we're striving for, but you, you have to judiciously still keep it in your quiver, if you if you will. Um, but, I mean, my, my fungicide program these days basically um, revolve around um, either my, microbials or plant-derived products. So there's, uh, or plant-derived sprays. So there's, you know, I'm a biodynamic farmer, so I rely really heavily on um, on uh, 508, which is um, horsetail tea, um, and that's that's you know a lot of a lot of silica, a little bit of potassium. Um, I actually um, <laughs> uh, analyze so the our the company in Oregon that does um, leaf sap analyses. They also do molecular soil analysis and they do molecular water analysis. So they can test farmers' um, source water and then what's actually coming out of the drip emitters for irrigation to see if they're getting picking up nitrates or whatever, you know, and they can adjust their nutrient additions yeah. uh, based on that. Or if, you know, maybe they have high chlorine or something like that in their water and they want to um, start filtering it so they're not putting all those chlorides or sodium or whatever it may be that's messing up their plants. Um, and, we don't irrigate, we're dry farm, um, but I um, use the, the test to take our raw water, test that, and then test the um, 508 tea afterwards uh, yeah. to, just to look at the nutrient makeup of what's there. And it, it was really interesting. Um, it wasn't just, a um, little background is it wasn't just horsetail tea. Uh, I brew horsetail tea um, like normal biodynamic indications would say to do. And then at the end of the boil, um, I seep in um, willow bark, and that's for salicylic acid. Um, I can not talk oak, about... Not oak bark, willow bark, because I know oak is also used as a tea. Yeah, oak bark more so for calcium. Yeah. Um, willow bark is specifically for salicylic acid, which is part of the um, uh, systemic uh, resistance, um, systemic acquired resistance pathway. Uh, it's a plant hormone that helps um, ward off diseases, basically. Um, we'll, we can go into this real quick. Um, I've noticed, so if you look at uh, systemic, systemic acquired resistance, which relies, uh, which fights off the um, disease, uh, disease microorganisms, um, there's also the uh, um, induced require, required is, uh, sorry, uh, induced acquired resistance which wards off insects from eating your, your leaves, chewing on your leaves. Um, and um, they kind of work in, in inverse relationships. So as jasmonic acid will go up to fight off the insects, the salicylic acid will go down in a plant. Um, so, and then vice versa, as jasmonic goes down, salicylic could, will go up. Um, very common cultural practice for us in um, in Oregon is to pluck leaves, to pull leaves in the fruiting zone to allow spray penetration so you get good coverage for your your organic um, fungicide spray program. Yeah. Um, 
which is the number one thing in fighting powdery mildew for us is coverage. When you're organic, you don't have systemics and laminar, uh, translaminar products that'll actually penetrate into the vine. They're all contact, so you have to get good coverage to, to have efficacy. Uh, so we pluck leaves, and I was thinking about it, and you know, you go out and you, you, you're out there plucking leaves and pulling leaves, and you, you just smell. You can smell the jasmonic acid in the air. It's a very distinct smell. Um, same thing if you're hedging vines. It's a very di same, very distinct smell. Yeah. That's that's the jasmonic acid in the air. And so we're doing these things to promote, um, to help with disease management. But at the same time, we're hurting the vine's internal uh, mechanisms to protect us against disease management. And so um, in, in studying this, willow, is um, really, it's uh, the silex species is high, is, it says exactly that in its Latin name is salicylic acid. It, you know, it's got salicylic acid in it in very high quantities, especially in its bark. So that's why I add that to my, my tea mix because I spray the, those around the time we're pulling, just before pulling leaves and just after pulling leaves. Right. Uh, just, to, just to increase, yeah. Yeah, the systemic, yeah, okay. Yeah, so you increase the, the salicylic acid yeah. in the vines uh, or signal the vines to, to produce more or to produce, it, produce its own. Um, so anyway, so so we were making this tea and I I, uh, um, I tested it and every, every single nutri nutrient went up um, with the exception of ammonia. The ammonia in the tea, the, I'm sorry, the nitrate, nitrate went down. So in the tea, the nitrate was lower and the ammonium was higher and the total nitrogen was higher. Okay. Um, and, and in the raw water, the nitrate was higher than ammonium and the total nitrogen was actually really low. In the, in the raw water? Yeah, just the raw water. Yeah. yeah, and then also, you know, also uh, silica was was pretty, pretty well, pretty high. Uh, calcium was pretty high, potassium went up a bit. Uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting to do that, that little analysis. Okay. Um, I suppose I, sh I should probably, I should probably look at questions. <laughs> How about um, I go in about the, um, you earlier asked about interplanting other species. Yeah, you, you have that one. I just have a look at some questions. That sounds good. Um, we'll jump in it. So, so in one of the blocks, I'm experimenting with interplanting um, other species within the vines, specifically to, um, to introduce um, both types of mycorrhizae. So ectomycorrhizae uh, is thought not to have an association with grapevines where endomycorrhizae is. So um, AMF um, uh, mycorrhizae has the association with grapevines. Um, plants like poplars, um, willow, back to willow, um, and several other species are shown to have dual associations. Um, I put the put willows in um, their native native more shrubby willows. They're not the giant like weeping willows that you think of, but um, just just so people have an idea how high we're we talking. Yeah, exactly. So they kind of fit in the in the trellis system throughout the growing year. Uh, willows grow very rapidly, so you can you can coppice them all the way down to the ground, and they'll keep growing back. Um, so the idea is at at pruning to come by or after pruning to come by and, and, and coppice them and then chip them in place. And then I have my own little wood chip piles of willow, which is a deciduous tree, which also goes back to the ramiel wood chip pile yeah. method. So in I'm doing two things that it, by having these interplanted species in there are multiple things is, you know, we're, we're, we're having more mycorrhizae that wouldn't be there normally by having them. And they work like, a, um, I think of them like airport hubs. 
So they, they're, they're actually connecting um, uh, the mycorrhizal communities together, both types of mycorrhizal communities together. So we're getting ecto and endomycorrhizal communities working together by having these hub species within the, the vineyard. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally think the more kind of different variations of different species you can have, like, and, you know, not annuals, we're talking perennials, we're talking trees, we're talking, you know, as I said, in Champagne, they were, they were doing pumpkins and, and wild strawberries and, you know, underneath the vine, which was pretty cool. Um, I think- I, I, I want to start playing wild, wild, wild strawberry sounds like a great idea. I've noticed a lot of them in our, um, our yeah. little uh, oak, um, our oak savannas we have in Oregon. You, you look at the ground if they're if it's not too dense. Usually it's more on the edges, and there's a lot of um, wild strawberries. So I think that would be a really good cover crop to play with. Yeah, I, that and herbs, and some people do native, native, you know, even well, not weeds, but native vegetation. So I know people play on that. Um, right. I'm trying to do my job. Questions. Um, what does the bricks of leaves tell us? I presume that's going back to maybe sap analysis or, or just monitoring the bricks inside a leaf in terms of probably its vacuole, how much like carbohydrates it's got stored in its cells. What 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 can that tell us? Do you think? Um, well, it could tell you the health of the vine. It could tell you the um, the photosynthetic um, efficiency of your vine. Um, which then gives you an indicator of where you are in the, the health, um, how, how the health of the vine is yeah. doing. Um, I mean, the, the, the platform to all plant health is really complete photosynthesis, right? If your plant's not photosynthesizing to its fullest energy, it's not, or to its fullest potential, it's, it, it's not really going to um, advance much beyond um, just trying to keep itself alive and we you know if we if we really want to ward off insects and uh diseases and have grape grapes that are producing the best flavonoids possible you gotta have you gotta start with good photosynthesis yeah, yeah. i mean this, this maybe also links into what we were talking about the other day about carbohydrate reserves in the plant you know if that bricks if it's not photosynthesizing correctly then we're gonna have a reduction in protein carbohydrate reserves across the whole volume. I, I think it'd be interesting for, like you were saying about your um, your carbon, um, your carbohydrate reserves from year to year and, and yeah. having your biannual or triannual bearing. Oh, it's a four year cycle, it seems to be. <laughs> yeah, and then you, you were saying you have the same, but bi biannual, you know, one year is really good and you see good inflorescent formation because you've probably got good carbohydrate reserves and then the second year it's not so good and then it's back again. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe that's, you know, the bricks is probably the best thing to see how well we're photosynthesizing during the year, really. Yeah. Um, that, that's a, um, actually just a good thought to, to keep in mind is, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is, is plant sap analyses is a really young um, science, you know, and so the more observations we can know now and try to link them with, with different trends, I mean, that, that's the exciting part about it is we're learning every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's another one. Um, if you could start from scratch, <laughs> I hate these questions. If you can start from scratch, what, would, what tips, actions would you consider to be critical for establishing a healthy vineyard? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, honestly, I think I think it'd be um, plant diversity and cover crops, and this goes to a, an argument in establishing vineyards that that I'm currently dealing with with several of the people I consult for. If people are planting vineyards currently, and they're wanting to do it regeneratively without herbicides. And, you know, and there's a lot of, um, I don't actually do the farming. I just consult on the farming. I just tell people what I think. Um, the actual, there's, you know, 
there's m several different ways, but the most common in, in the States is to have a vineyard management company that, um, that they're doing the farming, they're bringing the people in they're um, you know, doing all, all the, the, the work and planting and, you know, and doing the tractor driving and all that stuff. And so, you know, a lot of times and people with people I'm consulting for have a vineyard management company and they're, you know, they tend to really have more conventional thoughts of you have to have clean tillage, you have to have the soils totally clear, so there's no competition whatsoever. Um, I think, yeah, maybe that first year it's good to have, uh, have a clear cultivated pa path or area around the, the vine. But, you know, I've, I've, I've found these... Um, these irrigation trays that are made in Israel. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of them, but you just Google irrigation tray Israel and you'll you'll see yeah. them. Uh, unfortunately, they're made of plastic. And so this is always the big argument is like, do you want to put more plastic in the vineyard? While these, these trays last 10 years and can be completely recycled when they're done. Okay. Uh, it'd be cool if they're made out of hemp fiber, but at this the point in time, they're not. Um, you know, something that would last two, three years and then just decompose and become fungal food. Yeah. You know? Um, but I, I was using them in the vineyard I planted at home and I did some pruning weights just last week. So this is year two that I have them in, um, their, um, pruning weight was considerably more. It was more than 50% than the ones without the trays irrigated exactly the same treated exactly the same 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 cover crop same everything yeah um so their their printing weight was 50 percent more and eight out of the 10 vines that i i sampled i assessed to whether it could be laid down on the wire to be fruiting this year and, uh, and so i had eight out of, out of the 10 vines that could fruit instantly uh or this year so it would be in year two, year two, oh, yeah. it'd be all of the fruit, and that's. I mean, I did irrigate, so I'll put that down. I I, I was watering them weekly, yeah. um, but with these trays, it just kept it kept the grass around down. Uh, it regulated the temperature underneath the tray itself, so it was cooler during the hot days and it's warmer during the cold days. Um, it traps, it actually traps the moisture in there. So in those hot days, when it does get hot, the water vapors come up, it catches on the top of the tray and the tray actually funnels it back down to the grapevine. So it traps it and then it, so it's self irrigating itself throughout the hot days. Uh, the soil's like super tilthy and just very nice and gorgeous. Like the, it's like a, it's, it's almost like a mulch. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd probably use those in establishing while trying to establish a extremely healthy cover crop around the vines at the same time. Okay. We are getting a lot of questions about cover crops, just so you know. <laughs> How do you manage cover crops before the vineyards are established? Well, yeah, I think we, we kind of covered that one. We've yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd also look at some, you know, if you need to diversify the species, uh, a no-till seed drill is, you know, would be amazing to have. If you really don't have the money for a no-till seed drill and you want to um, introduce some more species, um, you could go with the Fukuoka clay balls. Uh, I don't know if anybody's um, familiar with uh, Fukuoka Matsunoba. He, uh, um, and I probably just said his name all wrong but i'm getting excited here um he he um uh he, he's a natural farmer in japan um and he recommended taking clay pot, like get it to a powder powder it up put the seeds in and then add water slowly in like a sheet and you just roll it back and forth and it rolls the seed up into clay into little clay round balls yeah and then um he'd spread them out by hand before the rains would come and then the rains come and the rains wash it down and then you have direct soil to seed interaction without having to drive it in. And so if you do this, you could take like an old um, broadcast fertilizer or seeder, the spin yeah. seeder, exactly. 
just put that. I mean, those things are, are dirt cheap compared to vineyard. vineyard yeah, you'd almost have a random drill kind of across your vineyard. So it wouldn't be dense populations, but you'd have some kind of vegetative growth. Yeah. Depending on how much you spread it, I suppose. Yeah, and you could look at seeds that have synergy within themselves and put, like, make clay balls with um, species that have synergies within themselves for that. And then you could do other seeds that have synergies with themselves and make the clay balls there and then just mix the clay balls all up and then you're you're broadcasting like a trio or a quad of of um cover crop species that thrive off of each other right next to each other at the same time you could throw in some um trichoderma dust into the clay or some mycorrhizal um yeah just to get everything to kick start. right into the clay and then you have all the all the good goods right in one. Yeah, I, I, oh, well, thank you, <laughs> Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I've just seen this thing. Yeah. Um, could you use mulchings, prune mulchings, instead of wood chip? I suppose that's yeah. Could you uh, mulchings? I mean, you can, can you can use. I suppose you could use prune, prune mulchings. It's just you won't get the same density as wood chip, I suppose. I mean, you know, when I when I've seen it, you know, the, the wood chip layer was about two, well, about an inch, an inch thick. Yeah, and usually you're going every other row, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think the way I think about this, and because I thought about this a lot, because I'm like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I mulch my 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 cuttings into the soil, and I think that's wonderful. Like, number one you shouldn't be burning your, your mulchings. Um, you know, I see the old guys in Burgundy walking down the rows with their, their burn barrels and shoving the, the canes in there. And um, I think that's could lead to some more problems than, than what it helps. Um, you, you know, our systems need that, that lignin. The problem is, is the grapevines on their own just don't produce enough. And yeah. where the grapevines evolved, they didn't evolve in a field of grapevines. They evolved in a forest, and the forest has multiple different species of deciduous trees around them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's that diversity of hardwood, I think, on the floor. Yeah. Helps. You know, I, think, I think that's what, well, when I went to Champagne, that's one thing they did stress. They, they used multiple, you know, different, different hardwoods to create this wood chip. Um, I think they put prunings in it. But it, it wasn't just breedings; it was it was everything. Yeah. Uh, are you integrating animals to graze cover crops in the system? So do you mm -hmm. use animals? Um. So, uh, Johan, um, we had just started. So last year we had chickens and ducks. Uh, this year we added more chicken. They added more chickens, and they're um, putting in sheep now too. Um, I think I, here we use sheep Every, everywhere. Everyone's using sheep. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I think that's um, huge on nutrient cycling. Um, I think if you know if you want to get a vine to be or a vineyard to be completely self-sufficient, that's one the only way you can do it without bringing outside inputs in. Yeah. Um, and. You know, although you're still bringing in some outside inputs because you're going to be feeding your sheep um, minerals, right? Yeah. But I always think um, keeping to the um, Allen Ho um, uh, sorry, <laughs> drawing a blank, uh, holistic uh, management, flock management um, ideals of Allen Savory's ideals of feeding them grains, but giving or feeding them mineral by putting out a smorgasbord for them, have the minerals be individual so they can pick and choose what they need. Because those sheep know what they're not getting from the grass they're eating in the vineyard. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean it also depends what cover crop you've got. You know, if you've got a very diverse cover crop, you know, you know, if you've got some radish in there, some beet or something like that, then, you know, it might be, it might be sustainable enough. Um, but no, I really, I really want ducks. I mean, you know, I keep on seeing ducks over in America. I definitely want to flock ducks. So we're, we're um, um, I just learned that Muscovy ducks, yeah, uh, which I've learned aren't quite ducks and aren't quite geese, and they have a back claw, and so they actually do perching. They perch like chickens. 
Um, I've heard that they're um, vole eaters, and voles are uh, one of our nemesis in um, regenerative agriculture, no-till farming systems in yes. Oregon, because you're not breaking up the little passageways, and they just multiply. They'll, they'll have seven seven generations in a growing season, and so the the population explosion can be huge. Oh. They, they feed around the cambium layer of the grapevines and actually cut cut off and girdle our grapevines by the end of the season. Um, so, so we're looking for ways, regenerative ways of um, relieving our vole problems other than just putting up bird boxes, owl boxes and raptor perches. Um, thank you both so much. I'm gonna have to jump in here. I'm sorry to cut it, but um, we have reached five o'clock and, um, or in the UK, sorry, five o'clock. I know it's not five o'clock there in Oregon. Um, and I just, I wanted to say thank you both so much that, yeah, it's so fascinating and um, mind expanding to hear the whole conversation. And I feel like um, definitely had the desired effect of, you know, answering some questions and pushing us to have many more questions um, yes. about what is possible here. And, you know, what does it look like to manage more biologically or regeneratively in the vineyard. Um, and as I said before, um, Dan, you know, if people are interested um, for consultancy support, Dan, I know that you are, well, you're a wealth of knowledge and help there. So that's something definitely get in touch with Dan and, and see what's possible. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who's tuned into these series as a whole, um, it's been really great to get things going from Nicole to Ben and Dan and Luke today. Um, if anyone is interested to hear more about Sector Mentor um, and what we're doing here at VitaCycle, you can email us at info at vitacycle.com um, and we'll get back to you. Um, and we're, yeah, as I said, we're really excited to be working with both of you um, when it comes to Sector Mentor stuff as well and trying to embed some of this kind of thinking and knowledge, you know, that's the more we can monitor that and learn as we go, the better in a way. Um, and so we'll send a follow up email with the video of this recording um, and links to more info about both Luke and Dan. Um, and that will be coming through over the next few days. And as I said, we see this as the beginning of a conversation and we really hope to support much more regenerative viticulture in the world for years to come. So. Luke, let's talk about that regenerative viticulture working group. Um, and we also heard from the Regenerative Viticulture Foundation, which has just been set up recently. Um, so it really feels like things are moving and the more we can share knowledge and learn together, the better. So thank you both so much. Um, and thank you also everyone for asking great questions and participating that, you know, it really is exciting to hear from you all. So toodaloo. Thank you. Thank you.